Hi everyone! Welcome to the very first episode of Egg Tarts, a project about Hong Kong. Before we start, I want to introduce who we are and what we do here. Egg Tarts is run by a small group of people who are passionate about Hong Kong culture. We hope to cover different facets of Hong Kong, from the dawn of mankind to the present day. From ancient pottery shreds in Lama Island to the towering skyscrapers in Central. From business magnates to movie stars and from street food to Cantonese pop music. By listening to us, you will learn many interesting things about Hong Kong. We do not limit ourselves to any specific areas of Hong Kong. Our stories are short and easily consumed on your daily commute or a chill afternoon, just like an egg tart. It's meant to be a small treat from Hong Kong. Anyways, without further ado then, let us begin. If you've been to Hong Kong, you might remember seeing paper cartons of phytosoy drinks sitting in every supermarket and convenience store, and the vintage glass bottle edition sold warm at 7-Elevens during wintertime. Since Phytosoy was founded in 1940, the drinks have grown to become increasingly popular among Hong Kongers. Today, every person who grew up in Hong Kong knows this household name, and many buy their products regularly. From a one-man soy milk delivery service to a multinational giant operating in over 40 countries, how did the company come to be what we know of today? In this first episode, we'll tell you the legendary story of Phytosoy and the man who made it happen. The story begins in 1935, when Hong Kong was still a British colony. A young man named Kui Xiong Lo, originally from the Guangdong province, just graduated from the University of Hong Kong. He soon found work in his patron's company, where he learned about the nutritional value of soybeans from an American ambassador. Two years later, a war began between China and Japan, causing refugees to seek shelter in Hong Kong. However, these refugees had severe health conditions, and many were dying due to malnutrition. Noticing the worsening situation, Lo remembered the lesson he had about soybeans. Suddenly, he had an idea. The young man went out and bought a stone grinder, some soybeans and sugar, and began teaching the refugees how to make soy milk to feed themselves. Amazingly, many of them had significant improvements in health. Convinced of the nutritional value of soy milk, Lo planned to start a company so that more people can have access to it. Soon enough, in March 1940, the Hong Kong Soya Bean Products Company was founded by Lo and his friends, with a factory in Causeway Bay, Hong Kong Island. From the beginning, Lo wanted the soy milk he sold to be the poor man's milk. In his inauguration speech, he said, What is wanted in the colony today is a source of supply of nutritious food which is cheap enough to be within the reach of the masses. The drink was branded Vita Milk. Vita stands for vitamin and vitality. The emphasis of milk in the name gives an impression that the drinks are as nourishing as milk. Despite good intentions, the company's initial attempt was unsuccessful. While the bottle of Vitamilk cost only 6 cents, it was still a hefty price during those years when many working-class Hong Kongers were paid as little as 10 cents a day. Furthermore, some people in Hong Kong think that soybeans are a food for the lower class. To make things worse, Vitamilk was not sterilized, causing it to spoil rapidly before being sold during the hot summer weather. By August 1941, the company reported a loss of 17,000 Hong Kong dollars, which was half of the company's initial capital. In the midst of financial difficulties, here comes more challenges for the company, namely the flames of war. In December 1941, the Pacific War began, and Great Britain was officially at war with Japan. Almost immediately, Japan invaded Hong Kong through mainland China and took over the city in two weeks' time. Since Lo doesn't want to be ruled by the Japanese, he closed the company and moved to Lingshan, north of Hong Kong. Originally, he planned to be a farmer, but soon noticed that he lacked the know-how. So, he went back to what he knew best, making soy milk. Lo opened a small cafe where he sold soy milk and other products. Surprisingly, it was a huge success. His soy milk was very popular with the locals and soon he was earning enough to provide for his family. When the war ended in 1945, Lo immediately returned to Hong Kong and reopened his factory. In two months' time, Vita Milk was back. 
This time, the drink included added vitamins, and its health benefits were marketed rigorously. It was now accessible through various retailers, a lot better than just door-to-door delivery. With these improvements, Phytomil gained widespread acceptance. By 1950, the company had enough money to build a second factory in Aberdeen, also on Hong Kong Island. Now, there's one more issue that the company was struggling with, shelf life. In 1953, they finally came up with a solution that would allow them to sell Phytomilk in capped bottles. With the extended shelf life, Phytomilk could now be sold throughout most of Hong Kong's populated areas. The drink can finally be kept longer, no matter in-store or in people's shelves after purchase. It's probably not hard to guess that the sales of Phytomilk instantly skyrocketed. During this blooming time, Phytomilk took on a new name, Phytosoy, a name it kept to this very day. From 1955 to 1960, the sales of Phytosoy grew fivefold from 8.5 million to 42 million bottles. As the company expanded, they started selling warm bottles during the winter, which is still one of the customer favorites today. New flavors like chocolate and malt were also introduced. By 1968, Phytosoy made up 25% of the Hong Kong soft drink market, with an estimated 78 million bottles sold in the city. Despite the successes, Phytosoy entered the 1970s with a series of setbacks. First, the company's ventures into pre-cooked dinners, baby food, and cheese all ended in failure. Then, in 1973, the oil crisis struck and production costs were tripled. As the price increases, sales plummeted. By 1975, Phytosoy lost 20% of their sales compared with 1970 and was on verge of bankruptcy. At this point, the company was desperate for a reorganization. So, Lowe downsized it and promoted his son, Winston, to be the vice president of the company. With a master's degree in food science from Cornell, Winston now begins his try to save Phytosoy. Not long after Winston was promoted, he introduced the folding paper carton in 1976. At that time, paper cartons were unheard of. Phytosoy became the first soft drink company in Hong Kong to use carton packaging. Doing this has obvious advantages over glass bottles. The cartons require no refrigeration and could be kept fresh for months. And they were disposable, much more convenient compared to glass bottles. Most importantly, the cartons were lighter, harder to break, and more compact to ship. This dramatically reduced distribution costs. Soon, the newly packaged drinks caught on with the public's eye. In just a few months, Phytosoy bounced back and was earning profits again. Seeing his son's success, Lowe stepped down as president in 1978 and Winston became head of the company. Lowe retained the position as board chairman to have a say in company operations. Phytosoy continued to develop and grow throughout the 70s and 80s. During this time, Mainland China was in the middle of liberalization and economic opening. Because Slow wanted to lend a helping hand to China, the company invested in many Chinese companies. Ironically, one of the companies that Phytosoy helped was Guangming Dairy Farm, which would later dominate the milk market in Hong Kong. By the 1980s, Phytosoy became a household name and the soy milk drinks grew into a symbol of Hong Kong culture. Phytosoy is no longer seen just as the poor man's milk, but a brand that many Hong Kongers grew up with. Today, Phytosoy drinks can be found in many places around the world with the Hong Kong diaspora and still remains an essential part of the city's identity. In 1995, Lowe passed away at the age of 85. His legacy, the young man who walked door-to-door to deliver soy milk, lives on. <laughs>